Okay, I'd like to call the committee the whole meeting for Monday, December 6, 2021 to order. Roll call, please. Mayor Gatino. Here. Trustee Carroll. Here. Trustee Curtis. Here. Trustee Gately. Here. Trustee Lowry. Here. Trustee Nedgevich. Here. Trustee Salazar. Here. All right. Thank you. Audience comments? Trustee comments. All right. Item one. Steve. Item number one, we have uh, Dan Watson from Rebbe Sharp Engineering, who's going to go over our recent bid results for our water tower project, and he's going to give options for um, potential ways to move forward. Good evening, everybody. Um, once again, the village of North Aurora opened bids on last Tuesday, November 30th. 750,000 gallon water tower. Um, as the previous bid on July 27th, we bid out two options. One is similar to the style of tower that the village has right now, which is a water spheroid, all steel construction, i.e. the golf ball on a tee. Uh, uh, the second type, there's one contractor in the United States that can build a water spheroid of that size, which is formerly CBI, which is bought off by a German. To get competitive bids, um, we bid out a second style, which is a composite tank, which is a concrete pedestal with a steel tank wow. on top of it. Um, there are three contractors that are qualified to bid a composite tank uh, throughout the uh, Midwest, I believe most of the United States. Prior to bids, we sent out to uh, the four contractors the advertisements. The, Bid was advertised in the Daily Herald. Um, we sent it out to three construction news journals. Um, three tank contractors picked up plans and specs, and we received no bids for this. Um, the last time on July 27th, we received one bid. It was from McDermott for the water steroid type style, style tank, but they did not meet the uh, village's joint um, US Department of Labor joint training or apprenticeship programs. Um, I've talked to all the contractors um, since they travel around the United States. None of them can meet that provision of uh, the village specifications. Um, That's why we had rejected uh, the previous one. They could not meet that from McDermott and also their bid was 40% higher. Price of plate steel has gone up quite a bit um, over the last three years. The, uh, this tower is required from a previous water study as the village is growing to provide fire flow and um, help out during those uh, dry summer months. Um, the village has basically three options for this type of uh, project. One is to bid it out again, but I believe the results will be the same because of uh, the village's US Department of Labor um, requirements. The second is waive that joint apprenticeship. Um, the village would still require a prevailing wage as in all projects. Um, or a third option would be to, to have the general contractors not have the joint apprenticeship training program, but have all the subcontractors. There's gonna be a painting contractor on this, which there is three in the Midwest that are union. There's like electrical work on this um, for the lighting on the tower that would all have to be a union joint apprenticeship training program. The underground contractor, the paving contractor and the excavator. Um, you could bid this out where the general contractor would have to uh, provide a list of subcontractors. And those subcontractors would have to provide their United States Department of Labor um, joint apprenticeship training program. So with that, I will open it up for any questions. So yeah, I, I, I did some research and follow up and I talked to the stakeholder holder. So I would have to agree uh, item three yes. is, would be the option. So it's CBI is the general contractor, the GC, is that correct? That would be correct. And they put on travelers that travel around and then they, correct. they would like to be exempt from the that portion. Yeah, is the, that the, it? The, the welding on that, you really don't want to take um, guys out of the union hall have them weld that right it's specialty so air, for the so. gc only to be exempt is uh, i think that's acceptable for cbi because they're the largest um tank builder in the that, area that, that is correct we'll so yeah i recommend option three or that would work i'm good with that i'm good with that too yeah. that seems a, i'm good with that 
That seems like the best yeah, option. That sounds like a great option. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Steve, anything else for item one? Nope, that's it. Uh, we have our directions. So now we'll just work with Rempy Sharp to get that ready for the next bid packet. Sounds good. All right, item two, recreational vehicles. Uh, at our last meeting, we had someone come in and um, ask questions about the recreational vehicle code, which is tied into trailers and boats, and it's all one. Um, what we decided to do before you know, jumping into it is, is just bring it back with an overview of what the actual code is. It's a complicated code. We get lots of calls on it. Uh, people wanting loosened restrictions, people who want more restrictions. So um, Mike is going to walk us through right now and just give an overview, and then the board can ask whatever questions you have about it, and we can go from there. Yeah, thanks, Steve. What I'll do is just kind of um, just reiterate what our current provisions are, and then I'll kind of walk backwards a little bit some of the recent amendments we've had uh, since my time here. Recreational vehicles are defined by basically utility trailers, pop-up campers, um, RVs, boats, um, it's sort of an all-encompassing category and definition for that type of vehicle. We allow for one um, recreational vehicle to be parked or stored on our property at a time. It can either be behind the house, behind the front of the house, as long as it's on a hard surface, um, or it can be in front of the house in the driveway, essentially, um, between, you know, we have the weekend provisions between, it would be noon on Friday to noon on Monday, so the entire weekend. Um, that also would, any anything that's stored inside would basically be exempt. So if you have a boat inside a garage or a detached garage or attached garage, that would not count. I'm only speaking to what's actually on a property. So again, you have that time frame of Friday noon to Monday noon to have it out in front of your house to effectively, you know, if you need to winterize it, work on it, maintain it, clean it, um, that's what that's there for. You can actually have it behind the front play of the house at any time, as long as, again, it's parked on a hard surface and it meets the other regulations. There, are, there is a reciprocity period between the April 15th and April 30th. And then again, in the fall, we have April 1st, to April 15th, where someone can bring it in and it can be in the driveway for those periods of time, um, consist, you know, consecutively during that time frame. So they can, again, work on it, winterize it, um, bring it out of storage for the winter and effectively get it ready for use for the, uh, the spring and summer months. And that's pretty much the gist of the actual um, provisions that pertain to recreational vehicles. In 2013, we had done a series of amendments. Um, one of the um, issues that came up at that time, 2013, was we wanted to include utility trailers as a recreation vehicle. And the, the, the goal behind that was to not differentiate between a RV and then someone that's bringing utility trailer home with you know, landscaping equipment, whatever basically saying that if it's not a passenger vehicle or something, then it kind of falls into that category as a recreational vehicle. Um, we also, at, at that time, there was a, we had the time periods from Friday noon to Monday noon included in that as well, but we also had a 48 hour time period. And I'm not hundred percent sure how that applied. I'm assuming that you had a 40 hour time period between Monday noon and then Friday noon where you could keep an RV on the property. Um, so that's, was it the code at that time? And we actually did remove that. And again, we went to the Friday noon to Monday noon as we have it now. Um, and again, we limited the number of trailers, uh, being parked or stored on property recreation vehicles, uh, to one. The year after that, we removed a requirement that was in the provisions at that time that re that required you, if you were going to store RVs and boats in your backyard, that it, you had to have a fence. Well, it was like a solid wood fence or a solid fence up to six feet in high. Well, in 2014, we got rid of that requirement. So it goes back to the regulations that I had mentioned before with regard to having one in front of the house between those hours and then one that can be stored behind the home as long as it's on a hard surface and it meets the requirements. So that's kind of where we're at now. And that's where we were um, several years ago. You know, I read this today or actually a couple over the several days. Uh, one thing that occurred to me is I, they make a good argument. Two people, one wrote a, an email and the other one came here and presented. And they both said the same thing, which makes sense to me, uh, board. Uh, and that is to uh, <clears throat> extend maybe 18 hours uh, to maybe Thursday evening at 6 p.m. 
Uh, and that would give them uh, all day Friday to prepare their camper for uh, a weekend trip. Uh, the argument that uh, by picking, up, uh, picking it up uh, uh, at noon, they'd have to take off work and it wouldn't give them time to prepare and they have to pay for a uh, campsite anyway, uh, that all made a lot of sense to me. So I got to thinking, uh, since that flexible uh, idea that in terms of uh, we had some idea where we could be flexible in the time and it was hard to monitor by the village, I thought maybe why don't we just have a uh, extend that time period on Fridays back to Thursday evening at 6 p.m. And that's my, my thought on it. Does that? Uh, Mike, I can answer that question because we actually talked about this internally. I think the provision, the Friday at noon to Monday at noon, even though it sounds, or Friday from noon to Monday at noon, sounds like it's kind of just in the middle of the day, but really that was because of people coming home late from a weekend trip on a Sunday night who had to park it because they got home at 10 o'clock, but they move it in the morning on Monday morning when they wake up or vice versa, when they want to get ready to go, they take off work early on a Friday, they get in their RV at five, six o'clock, pick it up and then leave from there. By moving it to Tuesday or Thursday, let's let's no, say no, you're no. Moving. I didn't say that. I said move it back from Friday at noon to that previous Thursday evening at six. That's what I said, so that they can have time to prepare their machine after they get it out of storage. That's I don't mean go from Monday on uh, in that other direction. I think that's a fair enough thing. To so just move Friday to Thursday. Move Friday to Thursday evening at six p.m. after work. I'm, I'm definitely not in favor of the flexible time because as we discussed before, then it really is on the neighbors and the homeowners to be watching and saying, you know, it's very hard for the village to enforce that if you have a flexible time, like you have 48 hours or 72 hours in a week that you can keep it there. I'm, I'm totally um, not in favor. I'm not in favor of that at all. In terms of making it um, 6 p.m. on Thursday to noon on Monday, I guess is what Mike is proposing. You basically then have four days out of the week that it's allowed to be there more or less, give, give or take six hours, right? Would you agree? Yeah, give or take six hours. So I don't, I don't know if, I'm not sure how I feel about that, but I was thinking um, as Mike was talking, maybe we just move it, we move it up a day because the person who came in and their concern was, is that, well, you know, they want to leave for their weekend on Friday. So maybe we move it from Thursday you know, um, Thursday, 6 p.m. to, I don't know, Sunday at 6 p.m. I don't own an RV, so I don't really know, you know, I've never uh, had to deal with one or how they're moving it off their property or where they take it to. Um, I don't know, just some of my thoughts. I don't know that we want to have it where they can have it there four days, and then you really only have Monday at noon until Thursday at 6, where you're, you're not allowed to park it. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with the 6 I, p.m. I provision. I mean, having lived next to somebody that had multiple boats and trailers and you know they lived in the south for about seven years and it did become a nuisance and it was also a public safety hazard in my opinion because they would have like a pontoon boat parked in the driveway and then you couldn't and they lived on a corner you couldn't see when another car was coming or kids were riding bikes um and, and i'm not against rvs at all my in-laws rv but when we look at a special subset of people who are professional rvers like some of the people that had come before the board i mean you know, I mean, we, we have to look, take a look at what is our village. Our village is a residential incorporated village. You know, people who want to have these types of vehicles and multiple trailers and stuff. I mean, they do have opportunities to live in Elburn or unincorporated areas. So I think what we really need to do is figure out, are we an incorporated residential single family village? And if we are, we need to kind of make sure that we, we are not just letting everything go. I mean, because we've got in my neighborhood, I mean, I've got landscaping trailers all over the place and boats all over the place, and it starts to become quite a nuisance. So I think we need to, you know, get good, good ordinances on the books and then enforce them. I, I have no problem with going back to Thursday night. I agree that makes sense. But I mean, I think they had quoted like 9% of people RV. Okay, well, that's it's, you know, 91% of the people don't. And we really need to understand that people move into a typical traditional residential neighborhood to enjoy a traditional residential neighborhood. People move into an unincorporated area because, you know, they want to enjoy, have a bunch of toys and enjoy them. And I think we need to maintain the, the sanctity of what our, uh, what a residential neighborhood is. I think for backstory here, what would help the board is uh, Mike's 
department deals with this more than anything, right? They, they take all the calls pro and con for having RVs. Um, it's our code officer who's out there enforcing it. So I think the question that I think for the board would be is, Mike, what type of calls and complaints and questions do you get? Because I can tell you, you know, the only time that I get people who want to change the code, it's usually because they're retired and, and one person came in who does it for, they travel for their living. So they use the RV for a living. It's very rare circumstances that we get everyone who wants to come in flexible. And the one complaint that I've gotten about wanting to change our code is because they want it more flexible, the, the 72 hours. Oh, I just, well, I'm retired. So I want to go on a Wednesday. I don't want to go on a Thursday. I would ask Mike this question. What do you get more people who are asking you to uh, amend the code to make it looser, or are you getting more complaints from residents that it's not strict enough? More complaints. See, but I think those complaints could be uh, answered really quickly if you just said our code allows. It. And, and I believe in zoning laws, but it, with COVID, it has hit for the last, we're not just talking about RVs. We're talking about boats and other recreational vehicles. And I don't think it's the prerogative of the village board to be telling people how and when they can recreate. Um, you know what? We have so many layers of government telling us what to do every single day. I, I, I could care less if somebody has a boat in there between the months of March and November. I don't care. Uh, one of the things Mr. Claypool asked for in the last meeting was, to extend the dates into November, if I recall correctly, because, uh, you know, it's warmer, longer in, in, into November. And he does use it, he said, I think, as, a prof as part of their profession. But I, I, I just, I mean, who cares? If, if, if people, I, I, I agree, you don't want a 30-foot RV all summer parked all next to you. But but I just don't think we should be telling people how to, uh, <laughs> when to clean their RVs or their boats. And uh, like Thursday to noon, to me, the, if they want to go for a weekend from Friday to Sunday, Thursday to noon till Monday to noon, and, and they can take care of their boat or their RV or uh, whatever. Um, I mean, and, and I would go into November mid-November. I mean, here, the leaves didn't even fall off the tree till a week ago. Well, they're still on it. <laughs> yeah. So, I don't have any I mean, problem with moving it to November. <laughs> I don't have any problem. I, I think the man made a good point about the, the two weeks to, you know, that basically to winterize. I think that makes sense to move it later in the fall, and I don't have any problem with that. And I would even thinking with the, the spring break time, uh, not everybody has kids, and not everybody has kids that go to a public school, but maybe you can tie it in somehow because that was one of his points, right? That the the the, uh, the public school spring break was before the the two weeks in the spring that they could use to you know get their RV ready. I don't really have any problem with shifting that around in a way that more accommodates people who are, who are using RVs. You know, I disagree slightly with Mark. While I, I agree, I'm, we're not trying to legislate or, or, or control how people recreate. No, that's not what we're trying to do. But I think what Laura's point is, and, and I guess we agree on it, is just the, the aesthetic. You know, and I guess it's just maybe it's just subjective. It's just an opinion. I guess for me, when I drive around my neighborhood, I don't want to see huge RVs parked in the driveway for all year long um, whenever they want it, you know, or all winter long or boats or uh, landscaping, you know, trailers or whatever. It, it's, I guess it's just an opinion about how you feel that makes the neighborhood look. So the For other me, comment, I don't really like it. The other comment we received um, over the years is the, what you brought up about November or March. And right now our code says April or October. In, in, in hindsight, looking back at that, March probably makes more sense. Spring break typically is there. And, and quite frankly, retirees as well. I think one lady specifically said that she might take her grandchildren on a trip like while they're on spring break. If, so it does affect the retirees as well to some degree. If the season is, that would be something if the board would want to change. If you're going to do November, I would also say, look at, at is March better than April and have it earlier in the season. Is April too late to actually service your vehicle? I don't even know if it matters. I don't own an RV, so I don't know. I don't think it makes sense, <laughs> and I, I, I can't follow the logic to change the time frame or something that is primarily used by retirees to align with school spring breaks. 
I mean, I think people are going to go when they want to go. And, you know, the other thing we have to remember is we're not doing an undue hardship on people by saying you have to move it after a couple of days. I mean, you can get these things ready at the storage facility. You can get it ready, you know, any place you want. Um, I, I just don't think it's going to be a hardship by saying, you know, you can't leave it parked indefinitely. That They have options. Yeah, I, I, I'd be hesitant to redo everything to just please a handful of people. You know, I think by trying to please a few people, you're going to upset 10 times as many people. You know, that, that would be my, my input on it is, you know, I, I keep saying this to Steve. I say this a lot, you know, you can't please everybody. So you got to try to please as many as you can. So um, I, I, I like the idea of maybe bumping it back to Thursday at six. Um, what, what about, is there options for these one or two off people that want to do it, you know, for spring break? Can they get like a permit, a special permit for that week, maybe once a year or twice a year to do it instead of the, you know, April 5th, April 15th to 30th, if they want to do it a week in March. Is that something they can permit and get instead? I mean, again, we're only talking about a couple. Well, we do here. allow, so we allow for, if someone has like a guest coming in from out of town, they can actually call yeah, in that. and we have like, a, I think it's a two week period. Yeah, I saw I, the guest thing. But. Yeah. That we have something like that now, um, whether that would extend into that sort of category, I'm not sure, but we do have something similar on the books for the. Yeah, I know, I noticed that. So I didn't know if that, that had to do with the actual resident as well, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm I agree with Laura and Carol and I, I understand what you're saying, Mark, but. I had a neighbor that had a, an RV that wanted that parked it there a lot. And until you have it there, it's pretty, you know, it's, it's, it's not pleasant. So, um, yeah, I mean, I would be, I don't know. I just don't, I don't think we want to go too crazy. I know you, you guys as a staff have spent so much time on this. It's like, just again, to please a couple of people, I'm just, I don't know that it's worth the time, honestly. Well, and I think we also need, this doesn't address landscaping vehicles that's a totally different thing right the, i mean the uh, landscaping trailers that's so that would a be recreational a utility trailer is different than a landscaping trailer not really it's, it's, all, so. it's all the same it's all, it's all the, the same, same. And, the, same. And, the, and the reason for that was uh, there was extensive discussion years ago about this and it was because they're all bulk items to some degree and if you don't regulate them together you're essentially allowing, let's say, one of each on the property, which means you can technically have a trailer, a boat, and a camper, which would be three apparatus on your property at once. So the board at the time combined it to one, one category. Don't we, don't we um, have ordinances pertaining to commercial vehicles that are right. separate? We do. And, you know, I'd have to ask Mike that. I don't know if certain RVs, once you get to a certain size, if that actually does change because of the license plate, I don't know that off the top of my head. But I know that some RVs don't meet that category. They're smaller. Yeah, the commercial vehicles totally get into the plate. I think it's D or higher. And then I think it's 90 inches tall would kind of categorize into a commercial vehicle. But the trailers we did classify as, um, as a recreation vehicle back in 2013, I think it was. So to me, uh, my home is my home, not a, a storage yard. You know, so I think it's a nightmare for uh, code enforcement <clears throat> as it is for code enforcement as is the, you know, they would call ahead and say, I need it uh, Tuesday and Thursday. And that's like, we have one person in code enforcement, you know, and that's like, there are storage places in the area here. There's one on the road. Um, but piggybacking with that is the utility trailers and landscape trailers. I mean, they're all over the town, you know, and that's like, I don't think it's fair to the neighbors that you know, A, you take your stuff home and work out of your garage or whatever be the case and park these things out front with big trucks. And and I know uh, code enforcement does work on that. And But I think it's, you know, this is all lumped together. They're going to be like, well, if you can bring an RV home and have it for four days, why can't I park my trailer in my driveway that has landscape equipment or e even boats? I mean, people have these quads and boats like Trustee Curtis said that her neighbor on the corner had three or four. I remember one was in the backyard, one was the side air, two were in the driveway. It's like, you know, at what point, yeah, we don't want regulations and it's kind of unfortunate that we have to, but, you know, that's what, you know, that's just, I don't know. I, I just think probably for an, you keep it like it is and that maybe the Thursday at six o'clock, if that appeases them, the weekend they're gone, they're traveling. So you won't see it there. It's just the, the pre and the post that they're, looking for some movement on so and as far as moving the dates like if you move the rvs up but now the boat people are like hey i 
you know, it's everything's frozen. I got to have my boat home in October to do whatever they do or whatever. It's like, um, and certainly we, as a board, we try to represent everybody fairly. And the, so like trustee, uh, Ned says you get, or Laura said, uh, 90, you know, percent of the people don't have them. So it's like, Sometimes we move one way to another and just because one person says something and it's like, we got to kind of look at the balance of the community and what we end up with. So I, I'm looking to tighten the language anyway. So we'll probably bring something back and then we'll kind of, you know, we'll, we'll discuss internally, but revisiting these provisions, I think there are some that need to be added and clarified. So we will bring something back regardless to have a discussion on the, on the existing provisions. Yeah. Mike had a couple of clarifications, but just so I have this right, um, are we thinking 6 p.m. then on Thursday? Is yes. that what we were saying? Okay. Most of us agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. All right, 6 p.m. on Thursday, keep Monday at noon? That's what I would do. Okay. All right, that's fine. Then we'll we'll add that that's in. That's somewhat of a concession. Then. Yeah. We'll add that in with some of the um, clarifications that Mike wanted to make, and we'll bring them back to the cow for a review. The only thing I was thinking on that, just to get specific, is um, – our code officer is here till 4 30. So if we have something until six, I don't know if that makes a difference. It's something we'll discuss internally because it does it does matter. Um, otherwise we have to have someone else come in and help us uh, monitor those things. So uh, we'll we'll discuss that and bring it back. What about three o'clock on Thursday? Now you have four full days where they can park the RV there. That's where you're at, and three days that they can't. And that's Kind of that was the internal struggle we had with talking about moving I, the times is by at some point you're actually flipping it to making it more apt to have RVs more than not have right RVs that's what that oh, the effect of that is the weekend. but they could technically park it there if they want they could yeah they have yeah you know uh, let me respond to Mike's concern um, just from my own personal opinion uh, if we make it six o'clock, three o'clock is not a bad idea, but it, that's also a good argument against that. That that's a whole, or whoever brought up that argument, uh, there's a whole lot more days that they can have it than they can't, is what we don't really want to avoid. Uh, but um, <clears throat> if we say six o'clock or even five o'clock, I was thinking after work, you know, figured why, well, but 18 hours because uh, that's an even number from 12 noon. Uh, she could enforce it to 4.30, and if they cheated for an hour and a half, I don't know how much trouble that would cause, I guess. Uh, I don't know if we want to say that officially or not, but uh, if you think about it, uh, uh, I wouldn't be too concerned. We could make it 5 o'clock, and that way there's only a half an hour window where it's Hey, he fine. said it. I mean, I'm good with that. If, if, you're, if you guys are saying it, it's fine. By Truth me. be told. <laughs> well, I'm the only one saying it. I'm, we're we're I'm pretty good with opinion. our... We're pretty good with our residents. So it's not like at noon on Monday, Marcy is driving up and down the streets looking for a boat at 1201. Right. It was so. like that in the old days, though. <laughs> what was that one guy's name? I forgot. Yeah, thank you. I, I do appreciate it. Because yeah, we're good. 6 p.m. on Thursday. Bring it yeah. back, and then we can always rehash it again then. Great. All right. Thank you. Item three, contractor registration, Steve. <laughs> Uh, this is a program that we've done for many years in-house. Uh, our contractors have to register with the Community Development Department. Um, Mike has come up with some thoughts on that that he would like to run past the board because it has some uh, budgetary uh, effects on the village, but there might be some abilities to make it easier for people to get permits in our town. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, this is kind of something we just kind of took on as a department. Um, i give a little bit of history on contract registration. It started in 2010 in the village. Um, we required uh, contractors that were doing work as part of a permit to register with the village. When I mean someone, a contractor, someone that's doing work, whether it be someone putting down asphalt or concrete on a, for a driveway, plumbing, electrical work, you know, painters and other, you know, cabinetry, those, those contractors are not required to register. So anyone that's required to do work as part of a permit is required to register uh, in order to get an actual building permit. So at that time, the contractors were required to be insured, bonded, and paid the fee uh, to register with the village along with the application. In 2012, it was later amended. They basically, what they did is, is, is as opposed to having a fixed registration fee, they just prorated it throughout the year. So they just basically divided the year into four uh, sections. And then if you registered at the beginning of the year, it was one fee, and then it, it was reduced uh, towards the end of the year. In 2016, we further amended that to help streamline the process. We said the, the fee is $150, but your registration is good for one full year. 
So not a calendar year at that point. Once you register, you're good for the entire year. But we did also eliminate the binding requirement at that time as well. Um, what I'm actually looking for tonight um, and feedback from the village board is basically to eliminate the entire contract registration program in, in general. Um, you know, the, the issue that we've had with it, it is it does really slow the actual permit process in of itself. Someone will come in, unbeknownst to themselves having to register, they will go ahead, register the, well, actually they'll, they'll apply for the building permit, get all their paperwork in, and then my department will tell them that, well, your contractors need to register. So then we have a permit sitting in, in our department, and now we have to wait for the, regi the contract registration to come in, the fees, the um, applications, and also the insurance um, at that point in order to release the permit. And it's weirdly enough, we do get, once a contractor registers with us, we, be, we get on some sort of list server, we just get you know, insurance facts to us all day long. So we're being inundated with insurance from contractors that probably haven't done work in town for years. Um, basically, it, it, it creates it's another layer of permitting in of itself. It's a permit in of itself. Uh, the fee is ultimately being passed on to residents. Um, in the 11 years that we've had the program, we've never revoked an actual registration. I included the uh, provisions for contract registration with the packet tonight. There is a revocation process, um, which actually the board would have the final say in that. Um, but in that time, we've, we've never revoked a contract, nor have we even come close to suspending one. And on top of that, we believe that the registration program would not prohibit someone, even if we were to revoke the registration from doing work in town from a legal perspective. Um, so there's not a lot of teeth in that program to begin with. Um, Essentially, what it does is opens up the, the consumer's ability to go out and then make sure that their, their contractors are licensed, insured to, to their liking. So they have the opportunity to still go out and make sure those requirements are met um, for their objective. Um, the, the program, again, we're registering, we're not licensing. So there's sometimes there's a misconception that if we re register a contractor that they're competent, um, that doesn't always uh, mean that. It just means that they've registered with us. We have the applicable paperwork is all that means. Um, Steve did mention some budgetary constraints. Um, the program in fiscal year 1920 brought in $46,000. Um, in fiscal year 20 to 21, it brought in $42,600. We are in the process of um, evaluating our building permit fees, uh, revisiting uh, those in books, revisiting those of the other municipalities. And I, I would imagine that some of those fees would be naturally um, raising. So it, it, would, it could actually cover the cost of some of the registration. And I will say year over year, our, our permit, actually our permit revenue has been, got, has been going up pretty substantially um, with the, you know, we have a couple of storms in there that have um, really been sort of an outlier with that uh, revenue. But for the most part, everything's going up. You guys have seen all the developments that's coming through as of late. So we've been busy on that. Um, so I did include the registration information here. Basically, I want to come back um, and give my, give my staff a Christmas present because it is a very onerous process. And it is onerous on homeowners and, and contractors. Um, for the small staff that we have here, I just don't feel that the program is really worth having um, for what its value is and what it has been and what has not been. The most important thing, and there were several times I looked at this and hesitated to bring it to the board because I didn't want to lose any control over the ability of, if a contractor failed for us to go after that contractor in some way. When we talked about the revocation of their registration, it was a red flag to me because as a non-home rule community, there's very few things that we can license. And in speaking with Kevin, when I determined with Mike and Kevin that there's really no legal teeth to it. It's in our code that we can revoke it, but it really, per, it doesn't prohibit us from stopping them from working in town. Then that's when I said to Mike, okay, I think we're okay to move forward because if there's no real reason, if it was a license to be different, if it was like a business license or a contractor license, it'd be like a liquor license. You can't work without that license in our community, but it's not, it's just a registration. And so once I figured out with Kevin and Mike, that there's really no teeth to it. I said, it does slow people down and it does cause residents who call in, they have to do all that work to get their contractors to call in so they get them scheduled. So at that point, it just became a financial issue to the village, which we think we can absorb. I, I'm fine removing the fee, um, but, but I, I do have a question because it seems to me when this was first enacted, it was enacted as a consumer protection attempt uh, to protect people that hire contractors in the village. And then in 2016, they took out the main consumer protection. 
<laughs> by or, or they me i was on the board i don't remember <laughs> but uh uh removing the bond that seems to be the most significant consumer protection because that allows the consumer to tap the bond if there's an issue with the contractor can we require a bond for a con for work being done in the village of north aurora without having a registration process that would be my question well, we would really have no way of knowing unless we did the registration program. But, but if we had a requirement, the consumer, the, the homeowner could say to the contractor, there's a village requirement for a bonding requirement. You have to have a bond to do the work that's in my house. As, as a board, that's not our role as a municipality. A buyer yeah. beware. I mean, we should trust our consumers to do their own homework and hire somebody. There's Yelp, there's reviews. I mean, there's so many ways they're, they're you know asking to see it i i don't think and especially if it's I, i've never liked this concept i've always thought this was a bad idea it's making consumers pay more because it does get passed through it does so mark i have a question for you i recently had my front door uh painted and the person came from indiana and she she did a full finish on my front door so that's somebody who i contracted to do work on my home in this situation, would that person have had to put up a bond with the village to do work in my house, at my house? No, no, only so for what, permitted work, right? We would require a permit oh, for, for doors, so yes. For works that would. require a permit. Okay, thank you. Yeah. That clarification. My, my issue are every time we have a hailstorm and we have people coming in from Texas saying they're going to replace your roof for, and, and then they're gone. And, and, and there's, they're bankrupt in two years and the consumer has no mechanism to go after them to for their warranty when they, you know, their shingles start peeling uh, or anything like that. And, and I know that the bonding process has been a good protection for people in the past. I think Mark in 2016, the, the rationale for eliminating that was to get, not put the village between the consumer and the resident. You know, if, if there was something that came up, what, what would the village's involvement be with the bond and how would they, what, what would our role be in assisting with that? It's almost a presumption that we would be involved in that process. You know, one of the things I'll look at, you know, you look at 2010, this was originally enacted. Well, I don't know how many people had smartphones back then or ability to go online and do, you know, do searches for contractors, business, better business bureau ratings, reviews, and all sorts of other information that's out there on these contractors. Um, I think a lot of that's changed since this was originally adopted. I think that was my recollection as well is that it was the fact that the village didn't have an ability really to enforce the bonding. It just, it was a piece of paper that said that they had bonding. Well, and you, you had brought up, Mike, about going over our um, municipal code, the, the permitting fees. You know, I'd also like to take a look at some of our permitting fees that don't really require any um, reinspection. Like, for example, I got a new front door three years ago. I paid my 80 or $90 for a fee and nobody ever came to check the work or anything. So what did, what did I get for my $90? So I'd like to take a look at fees that, you know, it's we're paying for it, but nobody's coming. Well, I think they did come because you, your door, they just look at it from the outside and they can tell it's installed properly. They don't really have to. Yeah, okay. the, the, I think we, I didn't mean, I, I think I called you out a little last time and I, I don't want to do that. I give it. Yeah. You have, once you get the, once the work is done on any permit, it is up to the homeowner's responsibility to give us a call to schedule the inspection. Otherwise, we really have no idea. I called the village and I was told, oh, we don't come out and check that. Yeah, it's just something that sure the it's be something that we just do a, a drive up and we can inspect. It. Well, the, the no, point I'm making mind. is, you know, I mean, that, that's a fee that we're paying and we're not getting anything for it. So I'd like to, you know, take a look at fees like that where the homeowner isn't getting any assurance that the work was done satisfactorily. Nobody came to my door and looked at my door. I think just uh, to jump in here about building permit fees and Mike and probably the position that we're hiring in, in my department that would fill a vacancy would do studies like this. But looking at permit fees, for instance, our driveway permit fee is very low. It's I don't know compared to other towns, but I think it's only about 35 or 36. Why do I need a fee to put a front door in if nobody's going to check? No, 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 where I was going with that is some permits, they need to all be looked at because some permits might be really low for the amount of staff time. When Mike actually looks at a, a driveway permit, he sits there with his ruler and actually scales it out, looks at it, makes sure, and it's, there's staff time involved in all that review that you never even see before they even go out and look at the pre-pour inspection or any of that stuff. And your, and your point, 
there's other permits that maybe there's less review. There's some in the office, but maybe not in the field. And that's what Mike's, I think, looking at is maybe some of our fees are too low, but some of them might be out of whack already. Yeah, and I don't disagree with that, Lord, because, you know, we have we do have backlogs of people that don't call in and we have to proactively go out there and they're just assume it's done and, and inspect it. If we if we're doing inspection on a different on a street, we'll go back to the files and say, well, the other permits out there on this street that haven't been inspected yet. We'll take them out there. And if they if the work's been done, we'll, we'll actually go through and do it because we do get backlogs. So I, I actually would like to revisit um, those fees, not only from a, a revenue perspective, but also to what how they would um, accompany a, an inspection of the need to have certain permits. So that's something I'm definitely willing to look into. The brick patio thing also is another one that we discussed about where the patio was like $35, but like the sidewalk going to it was 190. Like, <laughs> it should be maybe based on square footage. 193. If you want to get to your like patio. How much was it? $193. Okay. But I mean, maybe by square footage. And then, like Steve mentioned, some that have more time involved, maybe things need to shift, and, and that's okay. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm all for simplicity, not just not from our perspective, too, but it's it's way easier to convey information to the public when you have a fixed building print fees and you can say, well, this whole category is 50 bucks. Right. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm definitely all for that. So that's that we've actually been like doing said, that. Staff time and yeah. Because you have a small department. I mean, and I wasn't aware of it till I sit and watch, you know, listen and hear the stories. It's like I spent a lot of time pushing paper around and chasing things. And it's just uh, we're trying to we're trying to undo that a little bit. You know, we it's like sliding I, scale that you brought, you mentioned a driveway almost not always, but it particularly is a very similar size in most cases. Paver patios fluctuate. So that's one of our slighted scale ones. So you're right. It's based on the square footage you put in. But so the patio you, wasn't. It was a basic flat fee for the patio. I if you if I remember, it was 30. the connection from the patio wrapping around. So it was all considered. But the patio, you said, was $35. But a walkway, it was more. You know, it's like we just have to justify it to the people. And then sometimes mm -hmm. you can't rationalize fights like that. I, I can't promise you. I'll make, I'll make, I will make a promise that we will look to yeah. simplify everything and oh, then yeah, maybe, that's... you know, combine everything and make it a little. Yeah. Yes. I, I promise that he'll look at it, but not change anything. So <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if you want me changing is the problem. <laughs> My opinion on the contract <clears throat> registration is I, I don't see that it's any great benefit, uh, obviously, other than the fees, but you've indicated that that can be made up in other ways. So I think that consumers would be happier to get their permits and their work going more right. quickly, less, less cumbersome. I think most residents would be in favor of that since there's real no benefit to them and no protection to them. That would be my thought about it. And yeah, they're paying at 42,000, the residents. And then, you know, as a contractor, I'd be like, well, how come the landscaper doesn't have to pay or the painter or the candlestick maker, but how come <laughs> the cement guy does, or, you know what I mean? It's just, it's, and then, like I said, how can we be the police about it? And uh, just, you know, yeah. I agree with your suggestions. So if you're good with that, we'll move the contractor registration forward uh, to the board. And then what we'll do is we'll bring back eventually, and then hopefully in the next few months, we'll bring back the building permit just to kind of do an overview and see what we have out there, comparisons to other towns and whatnot. Yeah, that'd be great. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Yep, thanks. All right, item four, Steve. Item number four. I saved what maybe the least complicated for last is our annual meeting schedule review uh, before it goes to village board for approval. As you know, by state law, we have to set our meeting schedules. Um, this is the first year that we're adding uh, the beautification committee in. So I'll get to that in a second, but here's our schedule in front of you right now for um, our projected first and third uh, Mondays of the month for the village board meeting, 7 p.m. Nothing's changed. Uh, that's still still 7 p.m. unless the board wants to change it. 7 p.m. Uh, first Tuesdays for a plan commission. Uh, you see the two dates in yellow. Uh, this year, I think we only had one meeting that we missed because of holiday. Next year, we have two that fall on holiday. So we always miss Labor Day. Labor Day always falls on the first Monday of September. July 4th, apparently, will fall on a Monday as well. Yeah, we're good. We're good. Sounds good. good. So that's the meeting schedule then here below. We have uh, our North Aurora Days meetings, which we typically have the second Mondays of uh, the month. Uh, beautification, we have added that in now. It'll be the third Monday of the, every three months. And uh, so they'll meet four times a year. And we kind of have that spaced out so that uh, uh, we haven't lined up with basically the seasons because it helps us for different projects we want to do throughout the year. 
Um, any questions about that? No. no. Okay. Good. Okay, we'll bring it to the board for approval. All right, thank you. Anything else? Nope, that's, okay. that's it for me. So we'll have a motion to adjourn to exec session to review executive session minutes. Motion to adjourn to executive session to review exec session minutes. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you.